Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Brightworks. Today, looking at Coombe Valley, and uh, this is going to be an interesting one. We're going to we're going to take a sort of a hybrid approach with this video because some really interesting stuff happened in this game, and I think there's a lot of learning opportunities to highlight here. So we're going to do sort of a cast up until we get to the point where I want to talk about some stuff. Uh, but for now, just sit back and relax and enjoy this commentary as we take a look at Coombe Valley. Spawning here on the western side, we have our red team leader, is Beta Brick. <laughs> is Beta Brick going to be our red team leader here? Uh, and uh, this, this, for some reason, I don't know what this is a reference to, but I know that Brick reminds me of the uh, the Borderlands Two character Brick, or well, the Borderlands character, Borderlands, Borderlands Two, whatever you get it. Uh, reminds me of that Borderlands character. So I almost it almost makes me wonder if this is a reference to that, but otherwise somebody is going to have to let me know what I'm what I'm missing out on here. Anyway, spawning on the eastern side for our blue team, our cool colors, we have Psychoactive. Now that's a cool name. I could definitely see that name popping up in an MLG tournament. It definitely sounds like a name that you would announce at the Beyond All Reason Pro Tournament, or Pro League, Pro Level. <laughs> uh, I guess I have visions of grandeur announcing for that. Uh, we're, we're a little ways off from there, but a, a boy can hope, Candy. A boy can dream. Going for a bot lab here in the back line, so Psychoactive going to be teching up very nice and neat. That's going to be really, really good. Going to help this team out a tremendous amount. Our red player here is on the front lines. We've got a bot lab and we've got some grunts already moving out, which is really nice to see. I think I'm going to give it to Milan's for getting the first unit out on the field. Very nice. Uh, they are blitzes, which is kind of surprising because blitzes are relatively expensive compared to something like a tick or a grunt or anything else like that. So really impressive that we managed to get some blitzes out on the field already. Very nicely done. Blitz versus blitz combat. Ooh, they're scared. They don't want to touch each other. Oh, the green one's getting getting feisty. They go in for that. They go in for the kill here. <laughs> oh, the commander steps in to help, and it looks like the green blitzes will win. Our first kill of the game. Oh, second blitz comes into a vengeance brother. Doesn't realize that it's fallen right into a trap, and it will be reduced to smoldering ruin. Oh. <laughs> uh, apparently, Isbeta Brick was talking in the game, or talking in the, uh, talking in chat. I, I didn't even notice. <laughs> I was too busy paying attention back here. Uh, I was in charge of teching. I was supposed to tech up the entire team, and I made a huge mistake back here. So, um, I spent all my metal on T1 solar panels because I didn't feel like going for wind, and that was a mistake for sure. Uh, you'll you'll see now that I'm I'm stalling on energy. Uh, luckily, I'm not wasting metal, but I'm I don't have it all in the field generating for me, which is kind of unfortunate. So this was actually really really inefficient. You can see it's almost three minutes. I still only have a single advanced fusion reactor out. The commander is uh, still alive, and we're nowhere near ready to tech up, which is quite unfortunate. I was supposed to give I have tremor a T2, but uh, you'll see here in a minute that that actually does not end up happening. Oh, very nice. We've actually started reclaiming our lab. That's really nicely done. Get that started early so it takes less time later on. Psychoactive has gotten a air transport. Not sure if that was given by somebody else. Probably given by Divine Evil, who has the air lab out now. Uh, yeah, it looks like this was probably get handed over to Psychoactive for teching purposes. That's really nice. That's definitely one important part. I built my own back here to try and distribute some tech, but I also went for a vehicle lab, which you'll see coming up here in just a little bit. I've started to experiment with teching up in vehicles rather than teching up to the bots, just because the vehicles, I can hand out those consoles and build those hounds on the front line, which you'll see come into play a little bit later. But enough spoilage today, Milan's versus Cremor on the top of the hill. Got a, got a real battle on our hands here, folks. Both commanders scuffed up pretty badly, but it looks like they will disengage for the time being as this geothermal is well fought over. Swanty, turtling up a little bit back here. We've got a radar jammer. It's quite nice. A little bit far back, though. I think I'd like to see him up on this hill, or at the very least, contesting this forward position on the bottom side of this hill. Right here. Big Sean, or Big Scene, Cian. <laughs> Mr. 2000, Mr. Worldwide here. Uh, we do have a few untaken metal extractors. I'd love to see those picked up. That would be quite nice. Same goes for Is Better Brick, although, eh, actually, no, it's just this one on the front line. That one's a lot harder to hold on to, so I can't blame him for that. Saramore, using the uh, the commander to heal up this turret, but eventually the turret will go down, meaning that this position is going to be pushed back just a little bit further. Is Better Brick securing that metal extractor, and all is well in the world. 
going up to more advanced solar panels, trying to get that energy production underway here. Things are not looking great. I have Tremor building up some of that build power. Very nice. You love to see it. Looks like we got a lot of metal. And uh, yeah, I'm starting to send out some... Send out the commander for some energy production here, or some energy conversion, rather. A couple of blitzes break through the front line here on the on the, on the the fronts from the light blue player, Fruitkeck, and they managed to find a metal extractor and maybe a second one. There they go. Taking down metal extractors here. Very nice. Very, very worth the value for these blitzes. 65 metal in each of these blitzes, and they've taken down two of these metal extractors. So uh, as long as these metal extractors stay down for, let's see, 5, 10, 15... Well, anyway, it wouldn't be too long for these to pay themselves back for the uh, the damage that they can do here. Sniping this one in the back, that's also very nice here. Yeah, and they're well into the back line, which is quite annoying. The uh, the red player, in quite a bit of trouble here. Late laser turret, stalling on energy, but it does finally kill those blitzes. Interesting. We've got a uh, non-contestion here on the bottom side of this map. We've, we've got a bot here building a lot of construction turrets. Those are very expensive for the early game. Yeah, we're stalling on energy pretty badly here. Quite unfortunate. A little bit of aggression over here. Some pawns have actually broken through. They do catch an energy extractor, they or a metal extractor. They catch an energy converter. They get a bunch of solar panels. I think they might even get the battery here. There's basically no units coming out from balls <laughs> in order to deal with this. So these pawns are going to wreak havoc in this back line. They could definitely come back here and do quite a bit more damage as well. We're going to continue to fire down on this lab, but there is a pawn coming out eventually, and I think this one will be more than enough. Oh, uh, maybe. Maybe not. Ah, yeah, Toots, or uh, what was it? Sleuth Word has done an excellent job of making sure that this pawn gets its absolute most value. There are some gunships now trying to me trying to uh, mop up this pawn here in the back line. I wanted to say uh, clean up this mess and mop up and I ended up with map, map up or something. <laughs> something unintelligible. Uh, rocket bots here trying to burst down a bunch of these light laser turrets that have been set up on the front lines. It's very nice to see. Always going to be worth it to uh, get some of these Rocketeers or aggravators if you're a Cortex player out on the front lines in order to melt down these light laser to defend light laser defenses lets your units push without the uh, the threat of injury. Very nice to see here. Commander goes down and uh, I start eating up the metal. We you can see we've got two of these transports out. I missed it, but I went for a aircraft lab so that I could get two of these transports, and now we're going to go for the vehicle lab in order to get T2 vehicles. And again, the reason for this is this console, which you can see in the bottom left-hand corner. I know it's really small down there, but it can make hounds, it can make gunslingers, um, it can make recluses too, which is kind of interesting, but it can make a whole host of a different of different stuff. Uh, so it's a really, really, really helpful combat engineer. It's the counterpart to the, <coughs> excuse me, it's the counterpart to the Twitcher if you play Cortex and you play the T2 bots. That's the, uh, that's the Cortex equivalent to the combat engineer. Heating up this unnecessary construction vehicle as well. And we've got the energy to power this thing, so now we just need to get these constructors out and about. At this point, uh, Eye of Tremor has actually gotten all the way up to a T2, uh, T2 lab already, so kind of was behind the ball on this one. It was because I had to go up to that aircraft plant, so I didn't I didn't end up with uh, I didn't end up with quite as quick a lead as usually you would have here. Not sure why I'm stalling here. This is definitely a, a, a misplay. Stalling right here. I should have been producing more and more of these T2 constructors here. Anyway, the front lines are looking really dangerously low here. This bed of brick is suddenly encapsulated by a whole bunch of enemies pushing up on the front lines. Grunts are falling left and right. This player over here does not have any units out on the front. And suddenly his bed of brick is forced to take over basically the entire front line here. Artillery, trying to lay siege to these missile trucks, doing a decent job, certainly. But this is becoming a real problem. Milan's is doing a good job of getting a construction bot out here, or a res bot rather, out here to eat up this wreckage. Very nicely done. Oh, that Jin is launching its missiles, doing devastating damage here. Luckily, that one falls short, just barely, and the Grunts are able to jump on top of it. Yeah, 
And you can see I've given his bed and brick a T2 constructor and a uh, combat engineer here. And the reason I'm handing out these combat engineers, you'll see I'm actually giving them out to everybody. A lot of people are getting them here. Uh, T2 over here, combat engineer over here. When I'm handing out these combat engineers, the, the idea behind this is that people can build these T2 units out of their T1 factories. So you can use these to basically step up to a T2 here. Uh, but we're about to get to the part of the video that is the tutorial section, that is the is the guide here. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna pause and discuss exactly why. So you can see a whole bunch of the, wow, a whole bunch of these actually break through. A whole bunch of blitzes managed to get into the, the center of the map and devastate this person's economy here. See, they're in quite a lot of trouble. And I believe this bed of brick has officially disconnected. Oh no, not yet, sorry. We'll see here he disconnects in just a minute. His artillery are having a really hard time holding on to all this. And the front line is rapidly being caved in here. The, uh, the back line of blue, in the meantime, we're going for text. We have an anti-nuke up here, and we're going to be going for a reactor very shortly. We already have T2 metal extractors up, which is quite nice. Going for the T2 air lab here for the dark green player, and we have T2 have been handed out all over the place. And so we should be seeing tech ups happening here and there and everywhere. I'm finally getting my own tech upgraded. I'm going for those advanced metal extractors after giving everyone else some T2. Really nice. Very helpful. And at this point, our front line is looking pretty bad. <laughs> our production is really low. We barely have any uh, any build power here on the front lines. It's better brick. Luckily, still has some of these constructor up and running. Um, but a lot of this is looking pretty worn down here. I sent out this Lazarus. This is the Lazarus from the early game to resurrect this. Hopefully, I was I, I was thinking I would give it back to his better brick so that eventually he would be able to get T2 back up and running here. Something to keep in mind. It's better brick declares. The front is gone. And uh, I don't blame him. That is quite a lot of T1 tanks here. We've got blitzes and medium tanks. All sorts of stuff. Things are looking, uh, things are looking really rough. And his better brick says, I don't want to play anymore. You guys take. Okay. So let's talk about this. Welcome to the tutorial. I'm going to leave a timestamp down below. So some people might have just jumped to this point in time. If you're here for the tutorial, welcome. And we're gonna start talking about what to do when a player leaves your match. So here we can see that our frontline player has decided they no longer want to play in the game for one reason or another, this might happen. Maybe they rage quit, maybe they just have something to do. No, no matter what, the player is gone and that's all that matters. So how do you decide what to do here? Well, here's the way that I see it. When I, when I look at these games, and I do look at a lot of them, the way I see it, when you have a unit or when you have a player on the front lines, they have a base and they decide to leave, the there's two options for people that should take this, right? If you're the, the first option is if you are the player immediately adjacent, so that would be Milan's here, you're well within your right to take this base, take control of all this this these facilities here, and just use this uh, as your own and just make this make this your facility. That's option one, and that goes for any place. If it was this hot pink player, it would be this light pink player that took over. If it was this player up here on the mountain, it would be this one down here, the, the sort of tan players. But in this case, nobody took in time, and uh, it was really important that this front player took. So, the, so this is where the second option comes in. If you're a backline player, if you're orange or yellow here, myself, you're also within your right to take this, because what you can do is, and I'll show you this in just a second here. Let me unpause, actually. So I take over, and what you can do is now you can use this to basically turn this into your own production structure, right? Because as of right now, I have no production structure. I'm just entirely a backline player. So suddenly I've been gifted a production facility, and so you can see the power of turning all this production immediately into units. Now this is where those combat engineers become really, really handy. If you're given a combat engineer, or you notice that a player has T2 and you want one, be sure to ask for one because these combat engineers are super powerful. You can see that with this thing, I can produce these hounds right on the front lines here. And uh, you can also build construction turrets, by the way. These are those, it's also another very handy use set up for these things. Um, but I can build these hounds directly out of the, 
directly out of this uh, combat engineer. And the hounds are super great, especially against these vehicles. They do tons of damage. And so with just a few hounds, you, you can repel these pushes. You can see they tear apart those blitzes. It only takes a few shots in order to tear down these tanks as well. So these hounds are really, really threatening, which is really important. So that's that's step number one, right? Is uh, if you if you get a combat engineer, be sure to use them uh, because they will they will allow you to step into that T two realm much more effectively using the commander to just degun the most of those units. And eventually, this is held. And there's a few more units back here. Those are just some T one tanks, and it's not a big worry. So at this point, our army composition is literally just hounds and uh, whatever whatever T one stuff we can produce out of this produce out of this factory, right? But this is where the other part comes in. Make sure you have these res bots out on the field. I'm going to start resurrecting a whole lot of this stuff, but I'm also going to start. Uh, I'm also going to start making sure to uh, reclaim anything that it can't be resurrected. All these wreckages down here, right? Resurrect all this stuff as well. It's going to be super, super powerful on the front lines. So here's what you do. This is perfect. I'm going to slow this down here. Here's what you do if this happens to you. If you're pulling the back line and suddenly you have to take for the front line, this is what you do. So you notice I threw down a reactor. And then I queued up uh, two of these energy converters, and this is a build that I've talked about before. And uh, if you're if you're new to the channel, welcome. First of all, be happy to have you. Feel free to subscribe down below. Shameless plug. Uh, but here, but here's what I recommend: if you're looking for a build that you can do that's basically passive, and you don't have to monitor it, it'll just happen on its own. You go for a regular fusion reactor. You go for two energy converters. Then you go for another fusion reactor, two more energy converters, and then an advanced fusion reactor. Now it's really important that we don't dedicate too much build power to this. So you can see I only have four construction turrets here. That's gonna be 800 build power said and done. Uh, yeah, 200 a piece, so 800 build power plus you know whatever the constructor throws in. Um, very minimal amount of build power, build power in total. And the reason that you want minimal build power here is because when you are teching upwards, you don't want this to detract entirely from your production capabilities in the front line because you still need units to defend everything. So it's really important that you keep a, a nice, healthy balance here. So basically, I've queued this up, and then you'll see that I basically don't look back at this for almost the rest of the match. Like, it, it really just doesn't doesn't bother me at this point. So if you're looking for a good passive build to step up your economy slowly but surely, this is a great one. So remember, again, it's fusion reactor, two energy converters, fusion reactor, two energy converters, advanced fusion reactor, six energy converters. And you're going to be in a really nice spot. From here, from after that, you can start taking up to advanced fusion reactors, and you can start eating up your regular fusion reactors for metal. But anyway, you'll see that's not even necessary in the in the in the future here. Anyways, this base was ravaged a little bit, but we do have a bunch of resurrected units as well as these hounds dealing a bunch of damage on the front lines. The commander did go down, and we'll speed this back up to normal speed. That basically covers everything that I wanted to talk about as far as the tutorial goes, and that explains how you can do a passive a passive economy while still maintaining your presence on the front line. Uh, use your combat engineers, build some sort of eco that you can scale passively in the background, and make sure that you don't feed too much metal into it at any one time so that you can constantly be producing units. All that, if you, you know, if you get all that done, you're going to be in a great shape here. Now, stepping back into, okay, 1x speed here. You can see that there's a bunch of hounds, a bunch of tanks on the front line. These are all just resurrected, right? All this, all this army that the enemy threw in my face, uh, now we're just resurrecting it and we're just gonna hold it against him here. Meanwhile, Blue has gotten the tech lead here and you can see that they are going for actually almost exactly the same build. So if you don't if you don't trust me, take it from the other player in the match, the other highest true skill player in the match, right? We've got two fusion reactors and then four, uh, four advanced energy converters. And we're probably gonna start up a advanced fusion reactor sometime soon here. Uh, we're going to go for another fusion reactor. That, that makes sense as well. As long as we're continuing to scale the energy, everything is going to be a-okay. Now you can see, this is really important, when you're posturing on the front lines, you want to make sure that you take a good engagement. You can see that my concave is a little bit better than his. My, my units are spread a little bit wider. And uh, he, he's starting to bunch his up, which is really great for me because it means that my, my units are going to be able to take advantage of that AoE effect on all these shots, whereas his are going to be much less able to take advantage of that. So you can see a lot of these tanks just melt right here, which is really, really nice for me. 
the other thing is making sure to send these res bots forward super super critical component to this because if you're not resurrecting or reclaiming off of these front lines you're very quickly going to fall behind because you have to grow an economy and produce units at the front line and if you're trying to do both at the same time things are not going to go well i'm not sure who had this plan for uh <laughs> this plan for all these pit bulls that is a ridiculous maneuver um I don't, yeah, I don't even, I, I'm not even sure where this starts or ends. <laughs> I'm trying to look for it. Is it you? No. Well, anyway, we got a whole bunch of bombers coming in. Luckily, this player had the clarity of mind to build a bunch of anti-air. So actually, this was like the one place on the entire map that these bombers were going to be shot down. So we got really lucky here that the anti-air was not scouted. And uh, all of these bombers get devastated. Only, a, like, very few of them manage to trickle through. And uh, those that do will be shut down as well. Oh, these aren't pit bulls. These are energy converters. What on earth? Why did we queue that? Well, anyway. Yeah, AA is thick. But literally only right here. <laughs> if you look... Oh, jeez. Well, that's clouded. But anyway. If you look at the AA map, this is all of the AA on the map, and it's all clustered right around here. If he had bombed literally anyone else, it would have been tremendously effective. Um, yeah, we got really lucky there. Really, really lucky. A couple of scouts, and that could have been a tremendously different story here. Now the hounds are out, and they're on the front line, and they're going to be really devastating. You can see these things just melt through these T1 tanks really nicely. Those Janus can still be a pain. They definitely can hurt pretty badly. Uh, but not nearly as badly as they hurt T1 bots. And so as long as the Hounds continue to be produced, and this is on a repeat command, by the way, this, uh, this frontline army is going to be strong. Uh, now here's the problem, right? I know that eventually T3 units are going to come out here, which is going to be a really big problem. You can actually see the T1 labs are starting up. Now I don't have vision of that, of course, but I'm just expecting it at some point. So I know that I'm going to need some sort of heavy hitter, especially with these bulls coming out too. I really need something to deal with that. Uh, and I had the T2 constructor here, so I figured I would go for the T2 vehicle lab. And indeed, the vehicle lab was probably a, a decent idea. I'm going to show you the queue that I start up here because it might be really useful to you. My teammate, by the way, doing a phenomenal job of getting a whole lot of bulls out on the front line. Bulls are even more devastating against these tanks. And what I'm looking for, I want to show you my vision here. I'm looking for areas where I can exploit the weaknesses of the uh, of the players here. I need I need ways to uh, create chaos and, uh, and 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 exploit any potential gaps in the enemy's armor here. You can see the tick spam is started up right away. Really, really annoying stuff. Need some sort of way to deal with that. I start up my own bulls. And here's the queue, you can see. So we have radar bots, radar, radar jammer. Uh, we have two starlights, two bulls, and five lightning tanks. So the lightning tanks are mainly to deal with these uh, these ticks, the unit spam here. The bulls are to do heavy damage, and the starlights are to do sort of a, a pierce damage, I guess you could think of it. But the benefit of getting a vehicle lab out here while still having the console to build these bots I switch over to Gunslingers, by the way, is that it gives me two separate armies to control. So I can, I now have the Hounds and I have the Bulls out and available. And what that means is I, I have two, two ways to contest this army that's pushing on my base. And without that, it would have been really, really difficult to hold this. You can see the Hounds doing a great job of mopping up everything and the Bulls doing an, well, an even better job of, of keeping all of this nice and clear here. Ticks are extremely annoying. Luckily, these light laser troops were mopping it up. That wasn't even planned. That was just convenient. <laughs> But yeah, you can see these bulls are really devastating against these T2 bots. Luckily, I have a tremendous amount of them, and eventually the T2, the T2 tank will be brought low. The important thing to remember is that these tanks are on a slope here, so if you can catch them in an engagement where they're forced to uh, forced to fight against the slope, you're going to be in a really nice spot. To counter the tick swarm, grunt swarm, why not? Grunts are extremely efficient against those ticks. They can do very, very nice when they're not being blown apart by your friendly bulls. Oh boy, that's not great. <laughs> but yeah, certainly the grunts are very helpful. Especially these gunslingers are really nice too. These can do a lot of damage to the uh, can do a lot of damage to the T1 medium tanks. Kill them and then back off, and they're still going to be perfectly healthy. So that's really nice. Now you can see one of the benefits of taking over a player like this is that you suddenly have access to a tremendous amount of resources. You can see up there, I have, I mean, thousands of resources all at once. You can see this APHOS is now almost completed here. 
82 percent we're actually stalling on energy rather than metal and that's really really important because it means that uh you're you're gonna have to spend it all so making sure that you you have the metal is one thing but you have to make sure that you can spend it so i have multiple production sources here which should be should be obvious we have the uh the vehicle lab the bot lab and we also have this console building these gunslingers here all very dangerous all very impactful and the spread of units is really important too because you can see the uh you you, you can see how the units that are fast and quick are great for jumping on top of these artillery whereas the hounds which are much much slower are not really that good at, at jumping on top of this artillery so sieging sieging units are, are much less threatening because the lightning tanks the the gunslingers the grunts all that can push into those mauser and the mauser are distracted which lets the hounds the starlights push forward and do a bunch of damage starting up a geothermal plant advanced geothermal plant that's pretty scary those uh those do a lot of a lot of energy production so i'm really not looking forward to that being up on that hill huge army posturing here so i send the army forward to uh, try and deal with it lightning tank phenomenal at taking these out you'll also notice i switched the hounds over to gauss cannon because those ticks are uh those ticks are much better at uh or you're, you're much more likely to hit those ticks rather if you switch over to the gauss cannon the Razorbacks are finally out on the field, and that is always terrifying. The first Razorback you see is never a good one. Never never a good sign. I mean, unless it's on your team, I suppose. <laughs> but otherwise, that Razorback is really, really super scary because it means that the enemy is up to a tech level that I cannot really compete with here. Um, and at this point, I really need to start switching to these Starlights. Starlights are basically the only thing with enough firepower to really devastatingly damage the, uh, the Razorbacks here. At this point, I'm telling all of my hounds to fire on this geothermal plant. That's all I care about is blowing this up. And that last hit will indeed take it down. Blows up all of the production right there. And that was really, really effective. You can see I've queued up a ton of these res bots as well. And we're going to start reclaiming all this. Super important that we reclaim these re these uh, Razorbacks here. Either reclaim or, or resurrect. Either one works fine. But we need to make sure that these don't get uh, reclaimed by the enemy here. Because if they're able to recycle this metal into more units, it's going to be even even worse for us. So we're resurrecting on the front here. You can see a bunch of hounds coming back to life. All sorts of stuff. All good stuff. Shiva around now. So we do have our own T3 from the player back here. You can see was left to tech a lot more aggressively. So they have a much better economy here. They have a T2 air lab. They have the T3 gantry. And they have a couple of T1 facilities here. So they can produce way more units, which is absolutely excellent. Uh, they were given the opportunity to tech, and so that's that's why it's nice to have two techers, because one can always tech a little bit harder than the other uh, if something like this happens. And so you can see I'm, I'm barely through the advanced fusion reactor in this, but the economy is still growing, which is really important. You can see this is the other thing that I queued up in the back here, was a bunch more construction and then some more economy over here for whenever this finishes. But now that I'm eating up metal off this front line, I have more than I know what to do with it. And so you can see just how important that is, that you start eating up that metal. Because otherwise you're gonna be in a you're gonna be in a world of hurt when you're trying to find some way to uh, some way to fund all of this and suddenly there's nothing left for you in your bank account. Each of these bulls, by the way, is uh, 570 metal. So if you can get a if you can get a single one of these grave robbers to eat a bull, it's paid for itself five times over. Just something to keep in mind there. How many starlights do we have out on the field? We have four starlights on the field total. Probably enough to blast down maybe a single, a single uh, Razorback here. But definitely with the amount that are out, it's uh, it's it's pretty. It's going to be pretty difficult to deal with. They've also got hounds of their own now. But we have Shiva. The Shiva are really nice, especially against these big clusters of units. You can see the Shiva doing tremendous work, just evaporating this army right before our eyes. Now this was a really important push because as orange and pink were pushing down here, it forced blue to move. And what that meant was that it allowed, it, it gave me the opportunity. So what I'm thinking right here is, okay, I see blue moving down to address this army. What I need to do is apply pressure up north so that they can't move their army in. Um, and it works perfectly because you can see that these Razorbacks don't know whether they should push down south or whether they should, whether they should move up north. And so eventually they're just gonna have to kind of get stuck right here in the middle. That's kind of a high-level decision to think about, is how can I position my army in a way that scares the enemy into mispositioning theirs. I think probably the right decision here would have been to split the Razorbacks and two or three of them down here to deal with the Shiva, and then the rest of them continue posturing up north here. 
but luckily the Shiva do manage to uh, get pretty far here and cause a lot of general panic. And now the Razorbacks are out of position, which means that my army can move in for the kill. These Vanguard being extremely annoying, it's time to deal with them, so we jump the entire army on top of them. Loads of Starlights out now. At one point I switched to just producing Starlights, which is, uh, I mean, it's risky, but it also, it, it can pay off. See the Starlights firing. A couple percent off of a Razorback every time they shoot. A couple of vanguards up here. I was trying to find where those shots were coming from. It turns out there was a uh, vanguards positioned up on that hill. This is a huge push of Razorbacks. One, two, three, four, five Razorbacks, six Razorbacks, seven Razorbacks. But they're all looking pretty unhealthy, and we have the Starlights here. Starlights are really good against them. Let's see blasting them down. That one's down to zero percent. Every time these fire, they get they get value out, right? Another one of them melts. The bulls are also really good against the, the Razorbacks. Shouldn't underestimate the bull. It's definitely got a lot of metal in it. 13,300 13, metal in bulls versus 1,900... 19,000 no, 19, metal in Razorbacks. So, yeah, like a 4,000 metal difference. Definitely a lot, but also there's the combined forces, right, of, of me and this player here, so that actually works phenomenally. It also means that because these Razorbacks are up here, they can't defend down south, and so these Shiva are going to keep marching forward. The Hounds as well. I mean, look at that Hound army. That is tremendous. There's also some anti-air mixed in here. A couple of Archangels firing at these, uh, firing at these ships here. Airships. <laughs> Shiva doing a great job of causing devastation back here. Missiles being launched out of their uh, their little rear silo. Their little chicken silo back there. And you can see the air wall being absolutely devastated by all the anti-air that was brought in with this army here. Really nicely done, including anti-air on this army. Uh, Sleuthward doing a good job here. Important to remember that, because if you're going to push forward and you can tear down the air wall, you might as well. Because that just means that there's going to be more potential for a bomber, a bombing run later on. Commander goes down right here. Wipes out a bunch of production. Damages the lab really badly, too. Which is really nice to see. Uh, I think we're finally on to just starlight production. Yeah. <laughs> just producing starlights at this point to drive back the Razorback Menace. He's a menace. But look at how much metal is tied up in this field. 21,000 metal imparted into this field. Absolutely devastating. Really, really powerful stuff. See, the Hounds aren't terrible against the Razorbacks either. The Hounds are a... Uh, a what is that called? Well, they lob their projectile anyway, so that they can all fire even when they're clustered up in a group like this. So they're still effective. They're just as effective when they're clustered in a group as when they're spread out. When they're spread out, they're more likely to hit, in general, but uh, still the the effectiveness doesn't drop very much when they're clustered in a group like this, as long as they're all in range, that is. The Razorbacks are devastating, but they're not impervious, so you can eventually bring them down. Terrifying to go up against them, don't get me wrong, absolutely terrifying, uh, but certainly not impervious. Beautiful, beautiful fighter screen set up back here. This is exactly what you're looking for in a backline player, by the way. In case you're uh, you're looking to get into playing the backline, this this player back here is doing a great job. I have Tremor, doing a phenomenal job of making sure to support the front line with a lot of these T3 units, get a bunch of T1 spam out, and also building an air wall. Three really important steps in doing all of them in tandem. Very very nicely done. Nothing but commendations for that. And you can see I've not managed any of this, right? All this economy has just been building itself, and that's really the power of, of, of scheduling a big economy and knowing what you can and can't schedule, uh, and, and so it'll it'll just be built eventually. So that's a, that's a skill to practice, and you'll get familiar with that over time. But remember that most of this is basically entirely funded by reclaiming off the front line here. You can see that 23,000 is down to 10,000, and a lot of that is because of my reclaiming. A little bit happening over here, but for the most part, it's it's uh, me and Orange reclaiming a bunch of this off the front lines. Every push that you make should be accompanied by some uh, some res bots in order to either pick up your units and continue the push, or to uh, resurrect whatever you happen to kill. At this point, I give a resurrect command, and I'm not sure why. I probably should have just continued to reclaim here. Well, luckily, we got a pawn up and running. 
get a starlight back in action too. Why not? But yeah, this whole facility has been taken down, which is also really nice. The grunts are going to continue to move in. And a lot of this didn't actually have any sort of... Yeah, there was, there was not actually a whole lot of static defense here. This was relying almost entirely on unit, unit production to keep itself safe. See, some grunts are actually hopping on top of these vanguards. Vanguards are not super afraid of friendly fire. <laughs> They'll definitely fire on themselves if they feel there's a chance to. Now we get to see how Starlights do against Thors. It's really important that you build the right unit to counter the enemy, and so I know the enemy is going for these, these late-game T3 units, and so really the only option I have are these Starlights. He does launch the EMP missiles. That's really nicely done. Luckily for me, I just have so many, and they're spread out well enough that he can't really stun all of them. Gets a few over here and a few over here, but for the most part, these are completely fine. Remember, Starlights are explosive. I could even show you right now. That's the, that's the explosion radius when these die. So you can see, indeed, they explode really violently. So if you, uh, if you have them right next to each other, they will cause a lot of problems. So make sure to spread out your Starlights, especially. This base has been caved in, and at this point, the game is basically won. Now, uh, as far as uh, learning opportunities here, there's plenty. But uh, for one, you could definitely take away the, the idea that even if somebody leaves on your team, it's okay to take. You'll get a lot more experience for it. I mean, not like mechanically, but I just mean you as a player. You can see just how effective these Starlights really are. They can do tremendous damage. Ooh, and the Hounds come in for the finishing blow. And those Starlights, they just put down an entire Titan, just like it was nothing. Super, super effective. It's just really important that you don't uh, you don't accidentally clump them together and have them all die in one fiery explosion. That could be quite devastating. This base is now under siege by the, the Grunt Menace. The Hounds are pushing forward as well. Things are not looking good for this team. Not at all. The Shiva-Grunt combo is really, really potent as well if you're looking for a late game unit composition. Very powerful stuff. Always a fan of that one. It's just, it's cheap, it's easy, it's fast enough. And uh, there's, there's not a lot that can go wrong with it. You're really always going to be in a nice spot. Taking down the economy. Starting to flood through this base. We realize this is the air player, so we're just going to send the fighters to go patrol over their base. Everything is going to get shut down here. All of the construction, construction aircraft get taken down. Balls in the future refrain from building a Ragnarok. Was Balls building a Ragnarok? I didn't notice that. That's, uh, that's kind of funny. Oh yeah, over here. <laughs> you know, once you try the Ragnarok, it's sort of addictive. You, uh, you get to use it in one game and suddenly you're, you're addicted to it. Be warned, my friends. It's a dangerous trap. <laughs> Eventually this facility goes down as well. Whole lot of damage here. The fighter is continuing to circle and there's nothing this player can do about it because all of their fighters are just instantly shot out of the air, which is really nicely done. The, uh, <laughs> the the bot, or rather the uh, construction turrets here, trying their very best to uh, suck the planes right out of the sky. A bunch of grunts do hop on top of the advanced fusion reactor and it is all the economy for the dark green player. Bowles has tapped out of the game. Marauder coming through. I really like the Marauder. I think it's an excellent option if you're looking for a uh, a unit that can do a lot of damage but still maintain a, a price efficiency here. See the Marauder, phenomenal unit for for pushing into these back lines. It gets a lot of value for its cost here. I actually stopped microing this. <laughs> it's just I just told it to move and it, it just started running. But yeah, I mean it blew up all that economy, so it was definitely worth it. At this point, you can see exactly how devastating these uh, unit floods can be here. We've got tons of grunts in the back line, pulling apart everything here. Wind turbines, metal extractors, energy converters, you name it. The grunts will flash it down with their, uh, their imperial flashlights, as they say. <laughs> grunts back here are doing the same as well. But yeah, this is, this is the real problem right here, right? 
I could not refrain from bragging about this team. I was really impressed with the uh, the comeback that we had made. We had, we had almost completely caved under the pressure here in the middle of the map, and we managed managed to bring it back right in the nick of time. I was super super impressed. Minus red. <laughs> red was no longer a part of our team. Yeah, I was kind of lazy with the unit micro here. I won't lie. I definitely could have done a whole lot better. the last APHOS going up. Well, I guess there's one up here, but uh, the last APHOS cluster, I guess I should say. At this point, that player is completely tapped out of the game. That was the blue player, and so the last one left alive is Storm Combat. Holding out on the hill, we do have some snipers coming out. That's not a bad idea. We've got these, uh, got these starlights here, causing quite a ruckus. Very difficult to deal with. But luckily, this Pulsar will be more than happy to. Wow, that Pulsar can shoot tremendously far. Can shoot all the way down here. It's really, really impressive. Shiva, though, they can launch their missiles way up high. Indeed, they will. Let's see him firing into this uh, this little cluster of rattlesnakes guarding the uh, guarding the pulsar here. Interesting little maneuver. But the marauders move forward. If you're looking for a T3 unit, and you want a you want a strong T3 unit at a good cost, good option for. You want to tech up a little ways? Go for the Marauder. And it'll win you games. Thank you very much for watching. I know this is a little bit of a uh, little bit of a hybrid video. Let me know what you thought down below, as far as how you uh, how you feel about these kind of commentary, but also a little bit of a tutorial guide style of video. Just kind of a closer analysis, I guess I might call it. But anyway, thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.